Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. This is from Sydney, and this is my little studio. We are talking about creating the life that you want by finding out what the problems are, what the symptoms are, first of all, and then going down and finding out what's the root cause. And here with us, we have today Rick Cardwell from the north of England, and he's been a counselor and therapist for over 25 years. So I want to welcome you to the show. Hello. Hello and uh, hello to everybody that's listening. It's great to be here. So thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's good. We are in the same marketing group. So we I know a lot of therapists as you guys have worked out as I invite all of them here. But it's so good to talk about and have a free consultation, basically. That's what you get, a free consultation on YouTube. And how is how does this work? It works like talking about the symptoms. And today, in, in particular, I wanted to address a very erratic behavior with some anxiety and behaviors that we don't understand why we have them. And we might think, oh my gosh, I need some anxiety pills or maybe I need some CBT or I need some counseling. And we might get completely worried and start drinking to calm down. But sometimes what we think is a problem is not a problem. It's just a, a, a little alarm bell. And if you go and work with a specialist, you can go straight down to the issue and take away the root cause so you don't have to go and medicate yourself for the rest of your life because most of the time no it's just something that especially we say I see what's going on and that's exactly what Rick does and um, did you want to share the symptoms that your client was suffering from and I'm sure they will resonate with so many of you because they are really interesting yeah sure so this particular uh, client um, a teenager actually somebody that I worked with um, just just over 12 months ago, I began to work with this young girl. Uh, very interesting story, very typical of um, this, the, the factors of the, the symptoms of, of a teenager. And, and there's always complications when you look at teenagers, because as we have all gone through adolescence, through, through our teenage years, we do have these uh, natural pushing against the boundaries, trying to find ourselves exploring sexuality and alcohol and all of these things. So typically for an average adolescent, symptoms are can be seen to be uh, very, very different, although we do experience these. But we'll always, most teenagers will push the boundaries of normal behaviours because we're experimenting to find out who we, who we become as an adult. Now, when you add in the complexities of, let's say, uh, earlier experiences in life, if they've been complex, or, or very different, and then you put them into the mix of adolescence, there's a real concoction, a confusion about that person who isn't really able to understand themselves and the behaviours. And of course, as a parent or a caregiver or a guardian, understanding those behaviours is incredibly complex. So the complexities of mental health are already very, very difficult for teenage girls and boys without adding in the complexities of childhood experiences as well. So these are very difficult. Um, this particular um, case study, the, 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 the particular teenager in question, a lovely, lovely girl, bless her heart. Um, she, she, by the time she'd reached 15 years old, had become um, exceptionally socially anxious, didn't want to mix, never left the home. Fits of anger to fits of, 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 of tearfulness uh, and, uh, very short of empathy and these were a real concern for the parent because she couldn't identify with these behaviors but basically the 15 year old child had become secluded withdrawn angry bitter resentful but also had this this capacity to go into this very deep victim mode of you know feeling really massively sorry for herself and, and not able to connect with her emotions anyway. So it was kind of a, a, a tricky situation for the parent, not having that understanding. For me as a therapy, therapist, I had to try and unpick all of that and help her to understand the situation more, really. Wow. And of course, we, we do say, oh, they're just teenagers. They're going to grow out of it. But sometimes it's serious. And that can affect your life as a parent and also make you very unhappy as a teenager. Yeah, sure. And if you look at the statistics, you know, uh, uh, as a, a parent who's concerned about uh, adolescent mental health, uh, because, of course, we've seen a massive increase over the last decade in the, in the statistics around mental health. I, I mean, there's lots of good reasons for that, you know, mobile devices, et cetera, et cetera. But largely speaking, 
And if you go to the internet and look at statistics, you can find a lot of variables in mental health. Some people say it doesn't even exist, and other people say that it affects everybody, and there's everybody in between. But if you look at good, reliable statistics, ONS statistics, government statistics, and good research done by Mind UK or the, these, these very good organisations, what is clear is that mental health within, let's say, pre 15 year olds, so maybe up to 16, those unaddressed issues, by the time a child reaches 25 years old, you have twice as many children suffering from complex mental health issues than teenagers. So that means the statistics double in less than 10 years. Mm. So if it's 16% mm. of teenagers that are suffering from mental health, by the time these children get to 25 years old, it's 31% of teenagers. So if we can address mental health within teenagers in those formative adolescent years, then we're hugely reducing the, the, the chances of mental health issues when mm. children <clears throat> get to that age of becoming young adults and wanting to create a life for self. So this over the past decade, maybe a little bit longer, has become a huge issue for society. And I, my personal experience is that there's not enough to address these issues within society, within schools, within education for adults and for teenagers. And these problems are becoming exponential and increasing further. And I see this certainly in my clinical practice, hugely more this past three to five years of more parents contacting me with more concerns, with more erratic behaviours, angry children, withdrawn children, children that aren't coping with education well. And for me, this is a real factor to address so that we can help these young kids grow up into stable, reasonably well-formed children, um, adults, so that when they have children, they've got a better chance to be able to mm. perform better and understand how they're going to develop as young children into adults as well. So this is a real concern for me personally. It's something that I've chosen to tackle more over the past uh, five or six years because of the increase in these things. Uh, but I'd like you just to tell you the story of this young lady, if that's OK for you, Franz, and just go into a little bit more uh, of the detail. Now, understanding that, that, that these... these um, these symptoms and what this girl experienced is, is very unique to her. But when you look at the symptoms that is manifest from her experience, these are exceptionally common in a lot of teenagers that have, have experienced, let's say, um, a childhood that wasn't um, conducive to being positive or, or, or there'd, be, there'd be more of a level of abuse, let's say. So, so Chloe was actually from... Um, uh, a European country. She wasn't born in this country. And she had a very disjointed childhood because her mother had never settled with her father. She didn't know her, her father. They'd separated very, very young. And throughout her childhood, she'd witnessed um, her mother constantly chasing after uh, male relationships. And she saw this as a young child. She saw this kind of as a way of a mother's way of providing for the family, you know, to have a, a male relationship there was some sort of provision that helped them survive better than they did and so as you can imagine these types of relationships are tend to be more abusive and not good to witness or to be around and uh, as an eight-year-old uh, child she'd experienced a number of years of these types of behaviors lots of relationships as she described them now at eight years of age so this young girl eight years of age mm. She was moved in to live with her auntie in, in a country of origin with her older sister. And the reason for this was because her mother was leaving her country. She was moving to the UK with a man. And the plan was that she was going to get settled in the UK with this man. And uh, once she was settled, she would invite her daughters over to you know uh, connect again and, and to re-engage in the life and she was told very very little about the situation other than she moved to the UK and uh, with this man and, and eventually she was going to be invited over. Now she had very very little contact with her mother for the next three years 
There was fleeting sporadic contact for three years. And there was a number of reasons for this, which we don't need to go into. But ultimately, she was living with her auntie without a mother, with her older sister for three years while her mother was in the UK. Mm. Now, after three years, her mother invited, uh, let's call this lady Chloe, and a sister to live in, with, in the UK with her. And inevitably, her mother had had three years of another failed abusive relationship with a man and subsequently some other relationships. And he'd left. These had all failed. So Chloe's now 11 years old. She's now moved to the UK from a country of origin. And again, she's witnessing these cycles of behaviour from a mother chasing men, witnessing abuse. And uh, the, the story continues pretty much as it had left off from uh, a country of origin. Now, she has to create a new personal identity moving to the UK in a different country. She's 11 years old. She finds herself in a new curtain school, a new social setting. She has very, very few social skills, uh, and she's not able to integrate any of these uh, any uh, any of these skills to make friends, to make social connections. So she finds herself isolated at school, isolated at home, unable to create these social connections. However, she does connect with a, a couple of, of friends at school, which are from the same country of origin as her. So there's, there's, there's less of a language barrier. And yeah. she finds some, some solace, let's say in that. However, at, at 11 to 12 years old, she suffers extreme social anxiety. She can't really uh, engage in public. She can't go to parties or friends or anything like that. She manages to go to school. But as outside of that, she's pretty much living at home and not going beyond those boundaries of school. She demonstrates extreme fits of anger and rage. And she blames herself for everything that's ever gone wrong in her life. She takes full responsibility for uh, the abuse that she's witnessed, that she's been subject to herself, and also what, what she's witnessed her mother uh, go through as well. She feels that she's responsible for this, which is very typical of victims of abuse, particularly, you know, younger children. They tend to take that responsibility mm -hmm. on. Now, at 15, year old, at 15 years old, she, the mother contacts me because she's exceptionally concerned about the behaviours of Chloe, which, which are what I've articulated. Uh, the anger and the rage are uh, the, the most concerning because she's throwing things around, she's breaking things in the house, and, and, and the mother's extremely distressed about that. So Chloe's uh, introduced to me. I have a session with the mother, find out more about things, uh, and I, I began to work uh, through therapy with Chloe about 12 months ago and what came out of the conversation with chloe she was exceptionally honest with me we built good rapport and we connected really really well but it was very very clear that this poor 15 year old girl with this past experience which you know as i articulated is really the tip of the iceberg uh, was suffering from complex ptsd now when she's suffering from this complex ptsd as a young child that means that she's not going to learn to trust and she's not going to uh, be able to connect with people because of this intense uh, problem that she's got. And the problems is, is that, that she may end up following the patterns of a mother because that's what she's seen as a child. That's what she's learned. That's how the neural networks you know, connect. And the, these are the, the ways of thinking that, she can, that, that mm -hmm. she's likely to follow. And so there's a real, uh, there's a real chance that the outcome for this 15 year old child is going to be very similar from the patterns that she's learned from a mother. And I was, you know, I've, I've dealt with these things very, many, many, many times. Um, but this was a real concern for me. Now, Chloe actually was a very bright young girl, you know, intelligence wise. She was very switched on. She was very good at, at, at being able to uh, learn things <laughs> and, 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 at, and the support that she got through school, although it was minimum. Actually, she became she was clearly art intelligent, clearly articulate, and could talk very clearly about, you know, what had gone in her life. And I thought this was one of the things that they actually rescue her from some of the problems that she had. Now, Chloe has had, uh, let's say, an, an anxious attachment style. She'd never been really shown any uh, real love or connection 
uh, with a with a with mother. And the mother obviously had some problems with the types of relationships she'd been experiencing. And this attachment style was connected to the, PT, the PTSD, the combination of the, the abuse that she received from her mother's past and the relationships. Uh, and then the, the reinforcement of her mother leaving had caused her to really question what life was all about and who she was. And so the combination of all of these things coming together had manifested in this, this poor 15-year-old child in the symptoms that we were experiencing today. And that was uh, what where she was up to when she came to work with me. Yes. So we can see that it's not, I mean, sometimes from outside, we view a teenager acting in a certain way. And I hear all the time, I see in my community board or my own town, people, ah, my child has been excluded from school, he's been isolated and this and that because he was misbehaving. But have you actually looked into his life or her life and seen what's going on that is causing this outrageous behavior? Because Absolutely. instead of just punishing and putting in isolation, I was looking at some medical paper from Harvard and they were saying all this isolation is just exacerbating the problem and making the child mistrust the authority in the house and outside of the house. So why are we not looking to see what's going on instead of ex excluding people from school and assuming they don't care? If they don't care, we have to wonder what's going on inside themselves, which is reacting to their in internal environment in the house, maybe the extended family, maybe the society. There could be ethnicity problems. They're not integrated. Like if I move from the south of England to Birmingham, there will be a different area for me. I will have Absolutely. to fit in to a different type of society, anthropologically different, it might be different for me. And my, for my daughter, who is only 16, it could be tragic. She could be like a year before she has any friends. And so we have to understand that teenagers don't just mess up because uh, they're cr criminal. They're not criminal, they're reacting to something. And so we talked for like 21 minutes about all these symptoms and, and what actually was going on inside there. So because we are going towards the last 10 minutes, let's see what are the interventions that are possible that you have undertaken because you're also a hypnotherapist, not only counselor, and, and you also use advanced um, conversational hypnosis, which I think is great with people who think, oh, it's impossible, I can never be hypnotized, you're going to control me, but you can just talk. And as you talk, you get those little moments of subconscious work when it makes her realize actually I got the solution and it's, isn't it amazing when a teenager realizes actually the world is not about to crush me to fall over there is an end to this so what was your way of working towards resolution okay so you raise a very 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 good point there France because if you when we're talking about the these people's problems if a doctor focuses let's say on, on on the mood swings which which chloe had then he's likely to say oh well there's some elements of bipolar there we could treat that with lithium or, or valproate or other things and if the doctor focuses on despair and depression which chloe has then she's going to be Anti subject to antidepressants yeah now if she's got restlessness and lack of attention which chloe has it's adhd, ADHD. We can that That's it. yeah we go label um, for everything <laughs> exactly. Now, if she's got a trauma history of PTSD, then she's likely to be, well, talking therapies are, are often prescribed, but it's more likely to be an SSRI or an antidepressant or something like that. But none of these diagnoses will begin to meaningfully describe what Chloe is going through and what she's suffering from. Because if it was a broken leg or an ulcer or something that you can look at and make sense of and see how to fix it, then mm -hmm. that's logical, it's factual. But when it comes to these issues within the neural circuits within the brain, we're not even close to understanding the complexity of the brain and the human attachment systems. We're nowhere near that precision of understanding. And so these things become very, very, very complex. Now, the solution, well, let's have a look at what, I believe the solution is. Now, when we look at Chloe as a case study, as an example, what we need to understand, and this is relevant for all of us, for all of us human beings, whether we're in a bad place, a good place, or doing really well, in order to know who we really are, to have an identity, 
we must know or at least feel that we know what what is and what was real so we have to know the reality of life what has happened to us what's happening to us now and how real it is we've got to kind of observe what we see around us and label it correctly it has to have the correct label so that we have understanding of that now We've also got to be able to trust our memories and be able to tell them apart from our imagination. And when you've, most of us, we have incredible, powerful imaginations. We have a, a big brain and that means we can go to these abstract areas of imagination. But we need to know as human beings to be stable. We have to have this identification so we really know who we are and to be able to trust our memories and to be able to tell them apart from our imagination. Now, losing the ability to make these distinctions what that means is, is we are erasing, we're taking away the awareness and we're cultivating denial. And these are, which we do, we cultivate denial to survive. But the price of that is that you have no idea who you are. What Chloe was doing was taking responsibility that everything was her fault, that she was to blame for everything because of this fantasy, delusional idea of what her life was like. And so she lived in this fantasy world, not reality. And that means she never knew who she was. She had no idea who she was, what she was feeling and or who she could trust. And so this withdrawal was this lack of identification and this withdrawal was about not being able to trust anybody at all in the world. So with Chloe, which is you know, for all clients, um, let's say treatment or the way forward can be different. And I'll give you a typical example of the way forward here with Chloe. Uh, there's variations this because everybody's very, very different in their experiences and how they perceive that. But step one for Chloe is really to help her come to terms with the reality of the situation, to face that in a real way, not an imaginative, but an imaginative way, to bring her to a place of understanding and acceptance of exactly who she is and what's going on for her. And that's to face the facts of the truth. So the first step is for Chloe is to get closure, to begin to change her thoughts and her feelings about herself, to face the reality of it, not what she thinks has happened, not what the fantasy of it is, but to actually face the truth of what that is. And that is called closure. Now, once there's a reasonable foundation of reality for Chloe, when she understands what's happened to her, why people have behaved in a certain way, and she starts to accept that, that will ground her into the reality of truth. So she begins to perceive things more realistically and more factually. And then we can start to deal with the facts and the reality of what her life's always been about. So then we can move on to interventions. Now, the first intervention is that talk, that talking therapy of allowing her to understand what she's all about, how she feels, what's and all, even though that can be very, very uncomfortable. At least now we've got a platform of reality of her facing what she's been through and how she really feels about that in a real as possible way. So good interventions for that. My experience is EMDR is very, very good. So that's eye movement desensitization that uh, helps to modify the way that we think. But I've actually found that NLP techniques are much more effective. Um, I don't know whether it's just my personal use of techniques. EMDR was very effective, but uh, as I introduced more NLP techniques, neuro-linguistic programming techniques, to reprogram the way the mind thinks, uh, these have been very, very effective. And uh, you know, when I talk to people about PTSD, children or adults now there's some really great solutions for trauma there's some really great solutions for ptsd i can honestly say that you never fully recover from ptsd there's some physiological changes in the in the parts of the brain that never actually fully heal but overall these treatments do help you to disassociate the negative powerful emotion from the situation so you've still got the memory but you can detach the negative emotion from the memory so you can still think about it but you don't have that traumatic experience anymore yeah. and these techniques are really great for doing that these days you know the highly successful rates you know the really powerful uh, outcomes for people and for Chloe, for example, she's um, so let's say she's been had a last therapy. Gosh, time flies, but maybe three or four months ago, she had a final session. We actually went through about eight, nine, ten sessions with Chloe. Um, 
uh, really good, powerful sessions. Now, I know for a fact now she's currently the member of a sports club and she's participating in sports, which actually she's pretty good at. She's She's got this natural gift for sports. She's, uh, she's embraced more social circles. So mm -hmm. that means her friendship groups have expanded. Uh, incredibly so. Uh, she's uh, moving on to, uh, she's got an idea and goals of what she wants to move into for uh, a, a career, for a future. So she's a college courses are lined up for that for September. And uh, she's got a great idea of focus for that. She's really excited about that, bless her. And so she's now moved from being this, this social, tr socially trapped person in trapped in her own mind to be able to take her experiences into the world by changing the way she's reprogrammed her thinking to now join a sports club, expand on her social circles and look at a meaningful, productive future for herself, a career that's going to give her some reward for the future and some real focus for that. And that's created a real foundation of reality for Chloe. She's now away from that, that negative emotion that creates this fantasy state and she's in the reality of grounded in the reality of who she really is. She's realised that the things that affected her as a young child, although they were very traumatic and very powerful, actually, she's not that young child anymore. And she's able to rethink and create a life for herself as the young adult that she's becoming through a different focus, through a different reprogramming of her mind. And so that she's able to think so, so much differently and to be able to start to create an adult life for herself by reshifting that focus on her thinking. Wow, quite a story there. And I can see verse a very important thing. And I know we passed our time, so I should be closing now, but it is facing reality. And reality isn't what our peers are telling us, what the schools are telling us, what the social media are telling us, what fancy websites are telling us. The reality is what things are as they are, the things as they are not as people tell us. And a lot of time we get indoctrinated with all sorts of stuff and we think we have a thousand diseases and we yeah, became sure, hypochondriac, sure. self-diagnosis from the internet. We had to stop it. When it comes to start believing, not in us as a self-confidence, loved, important human being, but as anything else, there is a huge problem there. And it really is touching, touching the ground and say, yeah, here, who I am, look there, that's him, that's me, that's her, that's my parents or lack of parents, that's my ethnic tribe, color of skin, that's my situation where I am, that's it. And I had to face Absolutely. this reality. Whatever happened, cancer, divorce, uh, that happened. It wasn't my fault, it happened. And now I have to move on because, of course, if a teenager keeps looking backwards, he's never going to go forward in the time of a, of a life right. he should be planning for the future. So that gives me a lot of hope to know that with a few sessions, we can really frame what the problem is and really start from seeing the situation for what it is and not living in a fantasy world. Now, other people will look at us, why are you living like that? Social anxiety, what is that? Social anxiety many times is because we... <laughs> We think that something catastrophic is going to happen. If we uh -huh. don't fit in, we're going to have rejection and failure. And to get the loving attention, the lack of neglect that we've experienced, even with loving parents, we can feel like we are neglected. So we, we might resort to all sorts of fancy behaviors, but in the end of the day, it is with a therapist that we get to see, all right, what is inside me? Why do I want this? Why do I want that? Why do I think this? Where is this coming from? And sometimes all the thoughts we have are not from us. We watch too much television. We've been too much on the internet. We're inside us. There's a pure soul. They just want to thrive and to be happy, to be out in the nature, to meet people. We are people. They want to meet other people. We survive as a race with other people. We are not safe without other people. So this mechanism of protection have to be taken out and understood for what they are is protection from pain, isn't it? Exactly. That's so it. it is. And, and you, 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 you sum that up perfectly. It's all about us taking responsibility for our lives to understand that people don't live our lives for us. We have to live our lives as ourselves and find the true meaning of ourselves, connect with ourselves in a way that we really understand who we are and then create a life for ourselves that's productive and positive and good. And so based on who we are and, and work on that 
continually for the rest of our lives. But you're right, what other people in our lives, you could argue that people intimately close to us have a lot of value, but most of the people don't. And yet we fear judgment and criticism from these people that have no value to us. And that makes us not feel good enough. We're actually, we are good enough when we face the reality of who we really are. Yeah. And also sometimes the people who claim they love us, they put in us doubt about who we actually are. A lot of doubt. Exactly. And yeah, we yeah, start yeah. wondering, oh, maybe I, you know, I shouldn't be this, I should be that. But actually, inside ourselves, we know who we are. We just really know who we are. It's quite obvious. But somehow layers and layers of all sorts of philosophies that we hear and ideas that we have, because now everyone is a doctor and a psychiatrist, everyone is throwing um, diagnosis at your child. If a child is a little bit active, oh, he needs pills for ADHD. I'm like, really? <laughs> Just go back to your place because you're not my doctor. So you cannot tell me that my child has ADHD. You know what I mean, so step back, everyone, stop deciding that everyone else has an issue, looking inside your own issue, and allow these children to talk to a professional and open up and the parents can be just as biased and the parents can be indoctrinating their child to think that he's, he's lazy or he's bad like his dad who left or whatever. So the parents can be just as fault as everyone else. We, we can be biased because we see the situation from a different point of view. And in, in some occasions, we need to get the parent out, not to be in the therapy room because it's gonna destroy the process. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> he doesn't let the child talk. So, yeah, and that's all about parenting. Uh, but uh, most parents just want the best thing for the child and course, want the best and get the child to talk to somebody who has no agenda and they just want the child to be better and is going to listen and understand and help a child to understand himself and to work and self-regulate his own feelings. Because in the end of the day, an adult or an adult is a person who can self-regulate and say, oh, I'm feeling this, what's going on? Why do I feel like that? Instead of exploding and being anxious and hiding, et cetera, which are like two-year-old's behaviors, the temper tantrums and whatever. Exactly. So, you know, That's right. It's We could be talking for ages about this, but I'm so yeah. thankful well, we for you, Rick. For days. <laughs> yeah. Thankful because, you know, we just crush the surface here, but so don't worry too much about the teenagers. Yes, yeah, sometimes they're just teenagers, but sometimes there is a deeper problem, in which case they might refuse, but have a chat with a therapist and maybe a therapist can help to really get the real problem. A lot of times we think that the problem is A or B, but it's actually not at all. And if you go away from that, I'm going to solve it. No, below. you're not going to solve the problem. Is, in fact, there are no people that had very strong intervention because they thought I have certain problem. And then they realize, oh, this pill is actually killing me, this medication, because your real problem isn't that. That's right. That's incredible. That's right. I love mental health stuff, but yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. No, thank you, Francis. It's always a pleasure. I'll talk with anybody to offer out advice. So it's always great to share the knowledge and experience if it helps people. Yeah. So, uh, guys, if you want to ask any question to Rick Cardwell, we're going to be put links down below in our video and uh, through the podcast description and everything. There will be hashtags and all sorts. You can find Rick Cardwell and me for any questions that you want to, to ask. And I can always refer you to somebody if I think that is not my topic. So always happy to refer people because, you know, there has to be a specialist sometimes for a very specific problem. So thank you so much. Click like, share, subscribe, follow us on Substack and whatever you like. And I'll see you all next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.